Welcome to the Phil Fisher Podcast. Thoughtful Christian conversation from a slightly warped perspective. And now, your host, Phil Fisher. Hey, this is Phil. Welcome back to the show. I am here with Sky Jatani. Hello, Phil. Hi. What are you looking through your... I'm just getting a blank piece of paper so I can take notes. Oh, you're going to take notes? Yeah, this is in, for... In case we say anything smart. This is for when I eventually file my lawsuit. I just want to <laughs> make sure that I have accurate notes. That's good. Mm-hmm. I think we might have more on you than you have on us. Mm, that at, could be. Even at this point today. And Caitlin Beatty, the... <laughs> Print editor, managing print editor. Print managing editor. Print managing editor of Christianity Today is back with us again. Um, oh, I have to tell you who the show is brought by. We need to, It's time for a commercial message. Do, are you doing commercial messages yet on your podcast? We have started to force those upon our listeners. <laughs> okay. So, yes, nice. we, we are we're okay. giving a special offer to our podcast listeners. It's oh, fantastic. The Phil Fisher Podcast is brought to you by you. Yes, you listeners and viewers like you are supporting us on Patreon. If you want to help us out, we appreciate the people that have signed up so far. We're not at our goal yet, so please keep helping out. Go to patreon.com forward slash Phil Fisher, and you can help. Support the podcast because the stuff ain't cheap. We had to drive Caitlin all the way up from CT headquarters, which is about three miles down that street. Eight minutes. Eight minutes. And then did we give you any food or any beverages? There's a bowl of candy out there. No, you offered me the use of your bathroom, (laughs) which was generous. So, you see, that ain't cheap. Hey, it's a podcast. What do you know? Hey, it's a podcast. And we got video. Hey, it's a podcast, so lend an ear. The Phil Fisher Podcast starts right here. Oh, we'll talk to Sky. Hi. Hi, Sky. And Kaylin, too. Hello. <laughs> that was perfect. That's all you needed. See, it's just that easy. We got no Christian, but Kaylin's here for you. Hey, it's a podcast, so lend an ear. The Phil Fisher Podcast starts right here. The Phil Fisher Podcast starts right here. Have you considered doing a live song to introduce your podcast? We d- like we don't want to rip off the Phil Fisher. You could use podcast. a different instrument. You could use yeah, like a yeah, pan like flute a, or a marimba. Or you could you marimba. could sing in Latin. Mm, it would be classier. Vespers <laughs> chant to open up our 21st it, century podcast. It would be classier. Okay, uh, Caitlin brought. We have the new issue of CT with us. Uh, we'll hold it up uh, for those of you holding it up here. I'll hold it up here. Oh yeah. Uh, no, no, I'm holding it. We're holding. Oh uh, no, no. Uh. <laughs> You're gonna give people a headache. We have the new issue of CT. Um, Caitlin's brought in a couple of stories that she handpicked for our for our dining pleasure. Um, curated by Caitlin. Curated. Oh, I like the. Oh, I go. like the. Curated by Caitlin. Mm-hmm. I like the ring. Although yeah. my nickname is Kiki, so I would really prefer that. Cur- really? I didn't know that. Kiki. Kiki? Is well, that why f- would I have told you that before? Well, I've now. known you for a number of years. We've traveled places. <laughs> These are yeah. things you learn when yeah. you have We've a glass. We've had a glass of wine right. together. Like, so what? Wait, is this a family nickname or is this something that came yes. from the office? <laughs> no, it did not originate at the CT offices. It originated with my mother and has stuck. Kiki. For years. Mm. And my close friends call, call me Kiki, Kiki. Boots. No. <laughs> that, no. Let that be scratched from the record. My nickname is not Kiki Boots. <laughs> like just, be, just Kiki is fine. Be cute. Would be, here comes Kiki Boots. That would, you know the reference. My, yes, let's, I know. Okay, yeah, just making sure. Thank let's you. Let's get to the news. Me and Cindy Lauper, we both got that joke. <laughs> uh-huh. um, my nickname was Flip. It was? Uh, It's not anymore? No, it's not. Except for, well, my grandfather was the last one who called me Flip Mm. habitually, and and he's no longer with us. My sister will occasionally do it more as a a joke. Yeah. Uh, And then her kids will do it as honoring their mother's joke. Okay. Yeah. So you need to be called Uncle Flip is what you're telling us. Or or Flip or Do, which Mm. my sister would call me sometimes. She's kind of, you know... Mm. (laughs) <laughs> She's funny. She's funny she that is. way. Your whole family. Well, is, re- yeah. You must be related. Yeah, uh, yeah, we are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She's it's interesting because of her being my sister. Right. Yeah, and connected to my dad, who is the funny one. Um, Sky was your nickname. Sky is my nickname. It, and is your nickname. And currently, nickname. so you never had the opportunity <clears throat> to have a nickname on top of your nickname. Uh, not that I'm aware of. No. Skyper. Baldy. 
I was not bald as a child. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you were a very little child, you no, probably were. I actually were. was yeah. never bald. You, I was you born, were born with hair on Full head of hair. Yes, I was. And so was my daughter. Most of my kids were born with full never hair. never know how life's going to turn out. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, we've got stories. <laughs> stories. We've got stories. Yes, we do. We've got stories. How, how about, about you? you? Um, there was an incident two weeks ago. Over Memorial Day weekend. That was so 10 days with ago. With a gorilla. At the Cincinnati With a Zoo. gorilla, and people can't stop talking about people it. People are yes. going ape. I didn't think that we would need to address it on the podcast. It didn't. I didn't. Yeah. It didn't seem like that much of a story. Because do you remember when the same thing happened at Brookfield at our zoo here in Chicago? I think we have hmm. other it was about a decade ago. Yeah, but hmm? was it Brookfield? Yeah, it was at Brookfield. In the uh, Did they they didn't kill the animal though. No, uh uh-uh. It was a mother. It was a female. It was a female, and she was cradling the child. She saved but, the child. But do you realize it. we are now in the realm of animal gender stereotypes? Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> I'm going there. The the maternal the ape mo- yes, versus the, the aggressive gorilla. Exactly. Have you ever heard of testosterone? <laughs> uh, my scalp has. It's not. <laughs> When you try to rub it on there, no, it's what that's hair. what causes male baldness. <laughs> Too much testosterone, well, or not enough. I prefer to use my testosterone for something other than growing hair. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, like if, having dominion. Uh, that's right for, for uh, uh, stock car racing. Right, because I'm so masculine. Yeah, I mean. So okay, so did, did you remember that? Were you in Chicago ten years ago? No, I wasn't. But I read about oh. the story last week, and yes, the, right. the what happened at Brookfield was held up as a counterexample to what happened yes. at the Cincinnati yes. Zoo. So female gorilla picks up the child, although the child was knocked out. The child was unconscious. And it was a little field. kid, like a toddler. Yeah. Like, well, this this yeah. kid was three in Cincinnati. That's a toddler. Yeah, well, I mean, like yeah. a younger, but this like kid, a, this oh, eighteen oh. month old, this maybe. This kid got okay. himself into trouble. Right. He climbed over the fence. At he Brookfield, fell into the I believe the it was moat. fell out of someone's arms, okay. like leaning over too far. Something yeah. weird happened, and the mother gorilla took the kid and went over to the door where the people come in hmm. and and sat there with the kid by the door where hmm. the people come in and everyone mm-hmm. was moved to right, tears. Right. We all wept. Right. That gorilla is qualified to work in the nursery at church. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so some people are saying with this new story, how do we know that that gorilla wouldn't have taken care of the child? But if you see the video, right. he's yeah, like he's not holding so much the child care. like a Raggedy Ann doll. <laughs> right. I mean, it's really kind of terrifying to watch. It's horrible. Right. And I'm just shocked that this is still a story because, of course, killing a gorilla is worth saving the life of a toddler. But I'm not sure everyone would say that, but they're sadly. Endangered. How is that true? Children are not endangered. That is sick. <laughs> it is. So you're saying that our mainstream culture doesn't automatically just inherently no, I, I, see the the inherent. Well, I think value. most do. I isn't, think most do. But there are fringe people in blog. But on is, blogs. isn't that the direction we're moving in, though? Isn't what's what's? Well, the, certainly there's been more extreme versions of animal rights over the yeah. past hundred years yeah. with PETA, but PETA is not even... PETA is not mainstream. PETA is... No, so no. Yeah. when I was a college student, undergrad student, I remember seeing this car in on campus and it had a bunch of bumper stickers. One of them was, a, was some kind of Planned Parenthood pro-choice kind of bumper mm-hmm. sticker. I don't remember exactly what it said. And then the other bumper sticker next to it said something like, uh, like love animals, don't eat them. Mm-hmm. Or something mm-hmm. along those lines. So, it, and mm-hmm. wh- I remember I, I took a picture of it because I had a camera with me, and it was like this completely consistent worldview mm-hmm. on the back of this car, which mm-hmm. elevated animals to yeah. the status of humans and devalued at least unborn humans to disposable. But that person probably didn't see what we would call an unborn child. They would say right. a fetus. Right, so but, the, it, it, but it highlights the difference of worldview. Yes, but that, you do. You, there are some ethicists out there who would argue. Even a young child who's been born does not have the same moral mm. mm-hmm. capacity rights. or rights as an adult. So, mm-hmm. and when you do have an endangered species, and you have a was he a sixteen, seventeen year old gorilla who yeah. you know it, it there I could see people Beloved. getting upset. it. Does bring up Cecil the lion also? Oh my gosh, right. doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Well, the thing I did, I have these people <laughs> have been watching too many Disney movies. So, yeah, they personified these animals. Oh my gosh, they you totally name it. anthropomorphize. Yeah. Yeah. What about? I'm surprised that they didn't have any other way of of dealing with that gorilla apart from shooting and killing it. Well, Don't they, they have said, tranquilizers yes, or something? But it takes a while. It takes a long time for that to take effect. In the movies, it happens right away. <laughs> well, only if it hits a human in the neck. Right. That's the only time you think it was a mosquito, and then you fall to the floor. 
I don't think that works with an adult. A 500 pound male. They just give him a higher dose. Gorilla. I just think obviously yeah, yeah, the circumstance yeah. was like so urgent. It was. And Do I, you know what the, the at a zoo, the response team is named that is supposed to snap into action for an incident like that? SEAL Team 7. No, it's called DART. Uh, Dangerous Animal Response Team. A DART. DART. But they don't use darts. They then use they bullets. didn't use a dart. I know. They should have used a dart because mm. that was what they're... Can't they tase oh. him? Oh, yeah, you, are you going go to get close enough? Well, they can shoot. Them. They can shoot from a distance. <laughs> they have wires. That that, not that far. There should be. What is, what is your deeper question, Sky? I am just wondering: was there a non-lethal response that was op- an option here? But, That's all. but why did let's say there was? Like, why take the risk when you have? The life of a child. Is clearly Believe me, dangerous. if it's my child, right? Well, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But I, I just thought maybe these things had been thought through more. What if it was a wild pig? Would anyone be upset? No. That, if that it was a the wild gorilla pig. is attacking, or that. No. Has- <laughs> <laughs> My wild pig <laughs> jumped into the gorilla pit. No, Somebody get babe. That would be fun. That'd be kind of, you know, no, just we put definitely... random animals in the gorilla well, pit and see how they now do. Now that you mentioned wild pigs, yeah. we do eat pigs on a regular basis. What? I just had bacon in my salad last night Seriously? and it was delicious. Seriously? It was turkey bacon though, wasn't it? I think it was or bacon bacon. Better known as pi- uh, bird leather. Bird? <laughs> <laughs> That's what Stephen Colbert calls it. Mm. Um... <laughs> I, uh, no, if if a child was being attacked by a wild pig, would anyone think twice about shooting the wild pig? No. Even if you would kill it. There, there's something about, you know, because we have put gorillas up on a pedestal. Uh, they're so they're so like us. Right. Uh, know, and then and then we give them names. Right. That, that's right. Harambe. Or if, or if this were a that's, shark or something that's yeah. so clearly distinct from right. even humans. if the shark wasn't obviously hurting the child, just dragging it around in the water <laughs> <laughs> by its leg, you would not pause. You would see no. an outrage over the killing of the shark. Right. Right. So is it because Gorilla. Gorillas it's, are it's, so close to us in perceived yes. intelligence. Well, they, they are close to us in terms of DNA. Yes, but that's for another but, Phil Vischer podcast. But so are mice. We're all fairly close. We're all fairly but they, close. they they are highly social, advanced they're, yeah, they're yeah. Social, animals. They're yeah. social. They show emotions. They so, right. show you intelligence. Can, they show the capacity uh, to learn language. The thing is, so, we can so pigs, you I can believe. you can empathize with a gorilla or mm-hmm. a chimpanzee right. or a dog in a right. way that you can't empathize for a fish. Right. Yes. Or a pig. Maybe so a pig. So if a goldfish was attacking a child, <laughs> no, nobody cares. So that I think that's a yeah, it's a significant factor in the but, response. But don't we see a kind of breakdown in the people who are outraged over the killing of this gorilla, who then have no problem eating meat that has been procured in very inhumane, destructive ways? Sure. I mean, we a didn't, cow. We didn't a cow. see that. We didn't see it happen. It's so I far removed it from right. yeah. Yeah. Well, our world, some others, right. some others have made the point that the same week that this incident happened in Cincinnati and this gorilla died, which was it's tragic, it's sad, it's horrible, like a thousand or eight hundred people died in refugee boats in the Mediterranean trying to flee yeah. North Africa and Syria. Mm-hmm. But there's no. 24 7 coverage of that right. or outcry we have such a hard time connecting to the story of the thousands of people right but it's the story of the individual whether it's yes. a person or or an animal cecil the that lion well there, forth this a emotional lion reaction. which is why Got hunted right there was that strong response from that photograph that came out yes. was it last year from that, yes, that, that yeah. toddler boy the boy on, on the, the shore right. but right. again i don't know it still doesn't seem like there was Maybe there is. I don't know. Well, this... I think it's because we don't know how to s- fix the Syrian refugee crisis. But you but can. we feel like we have the chance to fix. Surely we can prevent a, a mm-hmm. gorilla or a lion being killed. That's a good point. That is true. So what has happened since? I what haven't have kept we learned? Up... They're well, going back and forth. They wanted the parents to be sued. They wanted... They're, and they won't be. Yeah, no, they there won't be, be any charges against them. I don't know And anything. then, of course, this story has brought out the crazy parenting outrage. Like, mm-hmm. who are these people? I never would have allowed this to happen <laughs> said, if that was my child. No said from child people who don't have children. Because no we've all... No mine, whatever Every fall. parent can think of a time. Oh, yeah. Do you want to share your story? I lost my daughter in a mall. <laughs> yeah, everybody has a story like yeah. that. I, I'm sure we've lost our children many times. I, I, I lost my son once at Disney World, but Aww. that's the happiest place on earth, so nothing bad. He actually <laughs> no. came back happier than when he left. 
<laughs> he was like, thank you. Yes, that was so, divine. I had a transcendent experience without you. Somebody, I was listening to a radio program about this the other day, and somebody made the point, maybe the story here is not about parenting or, or the neglect of parents or something like that, but why, certainly there must have been other people mm. who saw this child yeah. you know, beginning to get access or crawl right. through. I don't know how he mm-hmm. got in and didn't do anything. Is it partly right. that we've so atomized as a culture that we're no longer mm-hmm. looking out for other people's kids because it's like, hey, it's not my problem? Or mm-hmm. you're worried about how mm-hmm. other parents are going to respond if you step in and intervene with a child who's doing something. I've seen it. Right. I've been there. I've well, seen kids feel, assuming it was, yeah. it was Memorial Day weekend. It was probably very busy. It had busy. to be pretty busy. Right. People saw well, this. Well, and there's a psychological... Um, effect of crowds when there are that many people we have a hard time taking responsibility for one person in that crowd because we think someone so mm, surely someone else right, will take care of this right. someone else should stop that boy <laughs> <laughs> right oh. I hope someone comes along well, but the monkey's ha- stopping him it's okay oh, but haven't you been in a situation where you're watching a little kid somewhere do something either mm-hmm. wrong or, yeah. or dangerous and, and you're getting kind of angsty about it mm-hmm. but right. it was when do you step in when do you not will they be mad at me if I intervene, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I've been there a couple of times, and it yeah. creeps me out. Like we were. Did you intervene? I have Did at times. You intervene. I have at times. Were there consequences? Well, the problem, I, I don't know. Nowadays, everyone, no one's parenting their kids in public. They just give them a device to look at and assume that that's going to, uh kind of keep them in line. Oh, Sky found a soapbox. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah. Okay. Um, but on your podcast, when you were talking about this, you guys all went off in a direction. Now, it was, it was three uh, women on the podcast. You had a guest. There, we were all women people. Who were the yes. other women peoples? <laughs> yeah, the women peoples were <laughs> me and my editor, my assistant editor, Morgan Lee and Karen Swallow Pryor, who has done a lot on eth- the ethics of animal treatment and yeah. serves on the okay. Humane Society as the faith. Advisor. Oh, yeah, I think I've met her. Uh-huh. Yeah. Blonde hair? Interesting. <laughs> Honestly. Yes, yes, and she also has a PhD. Um, no, I'm just trying to visualize because we were at a conference together in California, yeah, and I'm pretty sure I know she who she is. She wears glasses. She teaches at Liberty okay. University. Okay, all right. I'm just trying to get this straight. And, and it kind of went in a, uh, a somewhat uh, anti-zoo direction. It did, yeah. The, the Our three wait. of you seem to be completely in agreement that zoo, mm. zoos are of questionable ethics. Hold on a second. We haven't even made the case. No, I just want to. Sue's before you. No, no, no. I'm not defending. I'm just asking. Is <laughs> do you do you think this is a um, should be a the Christian view of zoos? I don't think our view is the Christian view, but I think there are strong Christian ethical frameworks that draw into question the purpose of zoos and kind of the worldview that they assume that animals are for our entertainment. And then as soon as they start acting like animals, like in the case of this gorilla who was acting like how we would expect a 17-year-old male gorilla to act, mm-hmm. we then take his life because it, you know, imposes on the life of a human. But there, I mean, there are all sorts of arguments against zoos taking animals out of their natural right. habitat and not really being the best or... Um, Which they don't do a whole lot of anymore. I mean, SeaWorld had their whole... Yeah, uproar recently. It's because they were using it as a show, as a form of entertainment. Yeah, but, but I, would, I would argue have... that most zoos are seen as a form of entertainment. But that's how they make but money. It, but it isn't just like SeaWorld, going back to that. It isn't just that they were using these, these orcas for entertainment. It's that orcas, like gorillas, are incredibly intelligent, highly social animals. and putting Powerful them, and dangerous. Right, and putting right. them in a small confine. There was a lot of evidence that this was very detrimental to the health of these right. animals and they they suffered psychological distress as a result it's a little different than taking a snake or a field mouse and having them in a large enclosure right they're not the same they're yeah, not going to have the same draw, consequences where do you draw the line are you anti aquarium mm. phil had ferrets in his washing machine i had fer- i had ferret <laughs> in my washing machine but you had <laughs> three <laughs> ferrets yeah only one made it into the washing okay, machine I'm just i saying, got him out i think a ferret is different than a gorilla and an orca. Yes, like really? developmentally and in terms of intelligence, right, obviously. Right. And elephants don't do well if they're not if they're alone. Elephants yeah. alone do not well either do horses. That's why you put a goat in with your solo horse. If you want to have just one horse, you have to give them a goat to play with. It has to be a goat. That's a different they do very well together. Goats and horses do How well. How do you know this? Because I have family that lives in rural Michigan and we drive around and if someone has one horse, it usually has a goat with it. 
So they can play. Is that like a mini me? <laughs> they can play together. <laughs> it kind of looks like a horse, a but not really. <laughs> oh, clever. Very That's clever. Good. Okay, so are you anti aquarium? What are you goats. plugging there? Goats. goats. <laughs> this podcast is brought to you by goats. <laughs> Get one for your horse. <laughs> Um, no, I I, mm-hmm. I I understand why mm-hmm, mm-hmm. zoos could be seen as a way that we actually come to appreciate animals that right. we would never have the chance to see sure. otherwise, that they lead us to wonder over God's creation and actually draw us into a greater appreciation for animals. And maybe we translate that into, you know, giving to a conservation fund or mm-hmm. something beyond the zoo. But most animal ethicists would say that zoos are do not ultimately lead to most animals flourishing. Okay, so back up for a second. I read an argument years ago for zoos, and what that argument said was... It was in Zoo Weekly. <laughs> you may not know this. <laughs> so it this. might have been biased. But right, anyway, so but the argument was that most animals in the wild uh, struggle for around three areas. One is habitat, like a a safe environment in which to exist. Second, of course, is food. They need to acquire enough caloric intake to survive. And third is is a mate or some way of Mm -hmm. propagating the species. And what a zoo essentially does is provide those three things for an animal in a manner that doesn't require it to exert unnecessary stress. So, it's so is a, that an argument that all animals should be in zoos? No, but it's an argument that uh, in, in some case, I mean, the, you obviously can have an enclosure that's too small or doesn't allow an animal enough interaction or whatever. It can be a horrible place. But assuming it's designed properly and it's humane and it's uh, caring for the, those needs of the animal. And I th- again, it's different when you're dealing with a gorilla or an orca and you're dealing with, a, I don't know. Hamster. Right, hamster or ducks or whatever. A wildebeest. A cow. Uh, like Cosley Zoo here in Wheaton. Is, is that it immoral peacock, to keep right? cows in captivity? So anyway. <laughs> that question but... doesn't make sense. <laughs> oh. Does that make sense, though? Oh, what like, kind like, of rebuttal is that? <laughs> I'm just saying the question doesn't make I'm sense. I'm not sure you can say zoo's good or zoo's evil. I think it's what kind of zoo and how is it yes. handled yes, and what's obviously. the what animals. I think there are certain animals that should never be in a zoo. There are better ways Blue to whales. have a zoo than there. Obviously, right. you can have a zoo that is trying to provide the animals everything that they need, mm-hmm. not only to survive, but to flourish. And then right. there are zoos that are neglecting the care of the animals because they're making money on having these animals It's exploitative. It's exploitative. Um, I would say because we have worked in the entertainment value of a zoo, Mm -hmm. that zoos will have to be really proactive and intentional about choosing the former approach. So do you think a zoo can be educational and informative and seek the flourishing of its animals (laughs) <laughs> and not be entertaining? <laughs> yes. Should it never... But we call, should we it ne- call those like wildlife centers. But should we never seek to... Uh, I, I was in South Africa a year and a half ago and there was this rehabilitation center for cheetahs and they let us go in there and pet the cheetahs. Mm-hmm. Like, And I think they did that because they oh. know the closer the public can get to these animals, mm-hmm. they're going to fund it, they'll keep... It's a business mm-hmm. model that then right. allows them to rescue more and more cheetahs. It gives cheetahs. you Somebody an experience loses a that finger. gives you right. a passion for protecting and that It turns animal. out I am deathly allergic to cheetahs. I'm allergic to cats and big cats too, which I did not <laughs> know. Um, if you're allergic to a house cat, you're probably going to be allergic to a this, cheetah. This is, this is <laughs> what I discovered. Yeah. That's good That's to funny. know. But anyway, I mean, was it wrong for them to allow people to come in and do this because it funds their ability to rescue more cheetahs, which are being killed in South Africa because... Farmers think they're attacking their mm. sheep or whatever, and so their numbers are way down. My point is, is it can you ever have a good form of entertainment, I'm using air quotes, that's actually for the animal's survival or best interest? I mean, think about all yeah. the documentaries that have been made about different animal species and how it brings mm-hmm. awareness and then leads think to... Think about all those organ-grinding monkeys. Mm. And, and the, they were able to earn a living and to pay for their families... <laughs> I, I think that you, to answer your question, yeah. I think that you can, but it sounds like the situation in South Africa, those animals were actually endangered, mm-hmm. so they were in captivity in order that they could continue mm-hmm. breeding. And then there was a very, it sounded like there was a very selective process for letting people go and pet the cheetahs. Well, they didn't do a background check on me or anything. <laughs> they asked me, do you have the money? And I said yes, and they, they let me even, in. Well, the other thing of, is that you were in South Africa, right? Yeah. You weren't in, like, Cleveland 
trying to pet a so cheetah. A zoo, and most zoos uh, are bringing in animals from all over so the So if world. we have a zoo here in Chicago that only has animals indigenous to Chicago, <laughs> which that's okay? Which is kind of like which what Cosley Zoo is. It's, it's definitely better because you can recreate the habitat and the ecosystem if mm. if that animal mm. is used to that particular ecosystem. Mm. Phil's shaking his head. I don't know. Have you been in the Tropic House at Brookfield? Uh, they I make it rain. They make it lightning. <laughs> it looks like Africa for about oh, 50 <laughs> feet. <laughs> Okay, yeah. so we're, yeah, we're, you we're don't, divided you, on the you core don't get pushback on issue. your podcast, do you? Yes, yeah. we do actually. I mean, we've have definitely have well, debates when you when you have somebody from the Humane Society. I'm pretty sure they're going to have a strong view um, on zoos, just like sure. appropriately. Sure, but and I don't, I don't. It's not like the strong view on against zoos is one that a lot of our listeners have even heard of right. or considered. Yeah. So it's the, exposing them to a deeper deeper questions about the goodness of zoos. What about when there are species that only exist in zoos? That does not exist. That It's getting closer though. We're How many wild closer. pandas are left? Uh, not very many. They're mostly on reserves. But no, no animal originated in a zoo. No. What do you think but Eden was? <laughs> but it, <laughs> it was just one big zoo for how, Adam and Eve's entertainment. No, it was for God's entertainment. Adam and Eve were the prime exhibit. <laughs> it's how we're keeping some species going. Yes, that is the key. That is the key difference. There okay. is a case to be made for okay. preserving certain yeah. species right. who are in captivity. That's what happened mm-hmm. with the California condors like 20 years ago. They yeah. were like down to 20 couples and then now they're 25. Soaring. <laughs> soaring in numbers. Unbelievable. Like buffalo. If we didn't have exactly. if we didn't have buffalo in the Weed Park Zoo in Muscatine, <laughs> Iowa, in 1970, they they wouldn't be doing so well today. Because mm. we taught them, you, you, we you know, taught Congress them has vocational f- skills. We we taught them how to go to a job interview, <laughs> and now they're back on their feet. Do you know the Congress officially voted to make the buffalo the official mammal of the United States? Recently, yeah, a couple weeks ago, really. Mm. And so I think That's it was Colbert mammal? again who said, don't you think the official mammal of the United States should be people? <laughs> but yeah. no, it's a buffalo. Well, okay. All right. I'm just saying I don't think this is as clear cut. I think Are you pro no, zoo? I'm not anti zoo. I, 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 I don't think it's as clear cut, but I don't think that most people, not just Christians, I don't think most people consider what zoos imply about the world and humans' relationship to animals. And most of us have a consumeristic. That we're supposed yeah. to take care of, of them. But we have we're a consumeristic view of people too. We're supposed to take care. Well, that's of what, a what do issue. you think? What do you think professional sports is? We commodify people. We Wait, get, this is a total non sequitur. No, it isn't. <laughs> it isn't. Look at. I mean, look at the controversy that's happened in the NFL over concussions. Right? Are we go? Are we going to get? We we have we have taken these young men who play football and are really talented. We exploit them for our entertainment I think and it's for optional. Our, and for well, I they but no optimistic. because because they kept this information away from these players for decades. Right, well, they right. have it now, and they're still lining up. I understand, but you're still exploiting people for economic gain and entertainment value. Well, but that's true when you open but, a factory. And yes, hire it is. A workforce. Exactly. That's what saying. We commodify we the commodify big, people all the time. Get out of here, the big Bernie Sanders. Is, of course, we we commodify everything because we yeah. live. In a late capitalistic. Yes. So why should the culture? animals feel left out? Exactly. <laughs> At least they're not food. Right. We should train. That is no. <laughs> uh, it's not an either or. Of course, we use animals for food all the time. At the zoos, even. Yeah. Have a cheeseburger while petting a cow. Right. <laughs> exactly. I I had my daughter briefly convinced she loves Panda Express, and I and Aww. I and I had her briefly convinced that it was actually that's panda like a, meat. That's a mean dad joke. That is a mean dad joke. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Boy, I don't know. But see, know. you wouldn't want to eat a panda. They're too cute. Right. But you'll, you'll eat a cow or a what chicken. What were you trying to accomplish? Or a pig. What were you pigs trying are, to accomplish? Baby it's not because so they're cute. It's because they're endangered. No, it's because they're cute. Oh, no. If pandas if pandas look like warthogs, yeah. nobody would care. And they probably no, wouldn't be endangered. No, warthogs are cute because of the Lion King. Yeah. Boomba. <laughs> what was that, Phil? Boomba. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Can we keep him? But see, they had to. They He's had, so cute and all alone. But they had to make the warthog into an animated character with gas problems to make yeah, people and find know. him endearing. We love gas problems. If you're if you're an ugly animal, just have gas problems. You have to smell bad too, and we'll feel for you. Right. Okay. Next story. Next story. Whew. Man. What do you guys think about zoos? What do you guys think about the NFL? What do you guys think about Caitlin? <laughs> write, write, us, <laughs> write us up. Um, you interviewed <clears throat> a woman for CT who was an atheist and is now a Christian. And she was actually this, was willing to go on record. Yeah. Which is kind of interesting when people do that. Um, her name is, what is her Nicole n- Cliff. Nicole Cliff. It was, it was a first person essay that she oh, wrote. Yes. So we have a testimony in every issue. And she even like two years ago would say I was not only an atheist, but I was a happy atheist. There was no like God shaped hole in my heart. I was very content in my life as an atheist and my surroundings and my job like corresponded with that. And mm-hmm. then she read a an obituary for Dallas Willard written by John Ortberg and she Why? She was just surfing the internet. <laughs> she said she was friends with Ortberg. And she's daughters. friends with Oh, Ortberg's okay. Daughter. So there had to be some connection. Yeah. Who just so here we surfs Okay, the... so let me give you some clips. Um, how God messed up my happy atheist life. I became a Christian on July seventh, two thousand fifteen after a very pleasant adult life of firm atheism. Um, she moved to, from Manhattan to Utah. That was her first mistake. <laughs> if you want to stay an atheist. Yeah, yeah, stay in Manhattan. I'd started to meet more people of faith having moved to Utah and thought them frequently charming in their sweet delusion. I did- <laughs> it's a really funny piece. I did not wish to believe. I had no untapped, unanswered yearnings. All was well in the state of Denmark. And then it wasn't. I was going through a hard time. I was worried about my child. One time I said, be with me to an empty room. It was embarrassing. <laughs> so there's some cracks appearing. And then the second uh, incident was I was surfing the Internet and came across John Ortberg's obituary for philosopher Dallas Willard, um, uh, partly which said, somebody once asked Dallas if he believed in total depravity. I believe in sufficient depravity, he responded immediately. What's that? I believe that every human being is sufficiently depraved that when we get to heaven, no one will be able to say, I merited this. <laughs> A few minutes into reading this piece, I burst into tears. Later that day, I burst into tears again. And the next day, while brushing my teeth, while falling asleep, while in the shower. See, and a doctor would say, you just need Prozac or something. Uh There's nothing deeper going on here. Right. While feeding my kids, I would burst into tears. I decided to buy a Dallas Willard book to read anthropologically, of course. (laughs) I read his Hearing God. I cried. I bought Lewis Smead's My God and I. I cried. I bought Sarah Miles' Take This Bread. I cried. It was getting out of hand. You just can't go around crying all the time. (laughs) So she calls a friend, asks a friend if she can actually talk about Jesus, have a conversation about Jesus. And about an hour before the call, I knew I believed in God. Worse, I was a Christian. It was the opposite of being (laughs) punk rock. So when her friend called, uh, she told her, and then she says, we prayed, we giggled a bit, we cried a bit, and then she sent me a stack of Henry Nouwen books. And here we are today. (laughs) So that's interesting. Mm. Very interesting. But that's a wonderful um, bibliography of conversion, though. I mean, those books Mm -hmm. are ones that have been deeply meaningful to me and the ones that I would love to put in the hands of somebody who had Mm -hmm. questions about faith. But so Mm -hmm. often I think people... But don't they need a book on apologetics? Not not everyone. She actually says, uh, this is why apologetics, in my opinion, are hugely unconvincing. Um, What happened during that hour was I had been cracked open with cracked open to the divine. I read books that I would have laughed at before the cracking and the stars lined up and there was God. And then I knew, and then I said it out loud to a third party and then I giggled. (laughs) Um, But uh, no one could have in a billion years of their gripping testimony or by showing me a radiant life of good deeds or through song or even the most beautiful of books brought me to Christ. I had to be tapped on the shoulder. I had to be taken to a place where books about God were something I could experience without distance. It was alchemical. <clears throat> Interesting. What's alchemical? Alchemy. Oh. Yeah. I was thinking of Dow chemical. <laughs> <laughs> right. Alchemical? Uh, yeah. Um, so what do we learn from that story? I learned that it's just kind of this reminder, I think in the kind of Wheaton evangelical subculture, it's it's easy to forget that like God is up to things in mm-hmm. the world that are so beyond 
our programs and our outreach plans and what we think we God mm -hmm. needs us to do in the mm -hmm. world and that he is drawing people to himself all the time in ways that um, are beyond something that we could plan. I don't think that's an argument against all apologetics, right? but just a reminder, like apologetics work insofar as the Holy Spirit is present mm -hmm. in those moments. Is working with them. Yeah. yeah. And typically, though, quite often apologetics just make someone look for a better argument coming back mm. the other way, you know, so it's kind of an ever escalating mm. arms race of, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, well, I'll take that. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, you know, completely different because she wasn't looking for it and no one was chasing her down, right. you know, and trying to wear down her defenses. It, right. was, mm -hmm. it was God chasing her down, mm -hmm. trying to wear down her defenses, which gives hope yeah. to people. You know, if you've got kids that have wandered away from the faith, or you've got friends that have wandered right. away from the faith, and it's like, oh, I got to figure out how. What's the one way? What's the magic right. recipe to get them back? And they're, it's, well, it's love. I mean, there is really nothing else. That, that, and that was my experience. I came to faith l largely because of just something God had done, and it wasn't a program or some formulaic thing I stepped into. And what's strange is after that, when I went to college, I ended up for four years, most of those four years, having a really strong apologetic ministry where I'd go in and debate atheists or I'd mm. go into frat houses or Hemant? dorms. No, <laughs> not, oh. not him. He was He's younger than me. Yeah. Um, anyway, but I, and I did all that and I never saw anybody come to faith through those. Mm. But it was in the friendships or the, mm. the meaningful mm -hmm. relational mm -hmm. connections that more often things, mm -hmm. things happen. So mm -hmm. I got really turned off to apologetics Seen that it just it did become what Phil described as just mm -hmm. a, a an arms race, an arms race, yeah, yeah an argument back and, and forth, and, and also and like who's smarter or who has the more coherent, yeah, view. no, and then it makes Christians look like what we really care about is looking smarter than you, which yes, is the most awesome. But I think the one testimony. the one thing though that the apologetic ministry did do was at least I hope it did for those who had written off Christians as just idiots who don't mm. think critically or don't have any intelligent anything, I think some people could have walked away going, all right, there are Christians out there who are thoughtful and intelligent, so maybe right. I shouldn't just write this off completely. It helped restore some of that. But it wasn't... People don't get argued into the kingdom. Mm -hmm. They just don't. Mm -hmm. Do they get argued out of it? I actually don't think they get argued out of it either. Okay. I think it's on a far yeah. deeper level of emotional... I would agree with ...attachment that. or detachment. Yeah, I mean, so many times what, what makes people lose their faith is a negative experience in the church with, you mm -hmm. know, a relationship with a pastor or someone in authority or the reality of suffering mm -hmm. and not being able mm -hmm. to square the experience of suffering with the goodness of God. Yep. Um, it's rare that someone would, you know, read a Christ Christopher Hitchens book and be like, oh, that's it. I guess right. he's right. right. Unless know? they're already going down that road right. they're, they're wanting right. to there, be. Well, there was also the story last week of the lead singer in a Christian heavy metal band uh, officially telling his fans he's no longer a Christian. And the thing that tipped him over the edge was Richard Dawkins' book, The God mm -hmm. Delusion. And that's Which, not even a very good it's not a good No, book. Right. it's not a good book. But it gave him the vocabulary yeah. and arguments yeah. to... Yeah. He was already right. there, and he was looking exactly. for a way to explain it to himself. And I think that's actually what we do as Christians with apologetics that's books. Right. We want mm -hmm. to shore mm -hmm. up our own sense of how does this make logical sense in the world. So for me, when I was engaged in all that, and I'd read all the Christian apologists, and I was taking philosophy classes at a secular university and reading all these atheists, you, you I ended up coming away with it going, all right, if I want to be an atheist, there's a really good argument that can be made here. Hmm. And if I want to be a Christian or a theist or whatever, I can make pretty strong arguments there too. Mm -hmm. So that kind of took it off the table, that this is no longer just about who's got the stronger logical right, argument. Right. It's about what makes you happy. <laughs> I wouldn't oh, even, not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go there either, okay. but, but it made me realize there's something far deeper going on here and it isn't just winning an argument. Right. And what, what she, Nicole Cliff, Cliff, what she articulates there is really, I think accurate with a lot of people mm -hmm. that there, there is just this openness, this wondering either over the beauties of life or the tragedies of life going, is there meaning behind any of this mm -hmm. and right. where do I find it? And mm -hmm. sometimes the Holy Spirit can use that as an opening to, mm -hmm. and then the fact that she bumped into the right voices an Orberg, right. a Willard, a Nowen. Mm -hmm. um, and, and these friends, I mean, yeah. I think the, the having a close Christian friend mm -hmm. who they connected in all these other ways. Right. This friend is smart and thoughtful and was willing to get on the phone with her and just answer questions about Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's a huge right. 
factor. And think about it, if she had had this openness, this receptivity, but the voices she bumped into or the people she met were the crazy uncles that we talk about on this podcast all the time, <laughs> mm-hmm. how might that have shut it down like and going... Like Uncle Flip. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. But if, she, if she'd had this kind of prompting toward God and go then... your podcast and call you Kiki. Th- th- I wouldn't mind that. Oh. <laughs> I'll call you Uncle Kiki. Okay. I mind that a little <laughs> okay. bit. Okay. Yeah. If she had this prompting toward God, but then bumped into these people who she saw as angry, fearful, bigoted, you know, mm-hmm. would that have kind of short circuited right. the whole thing? Right. But then does that, I mean, at what point do we say we're not going to say anything in the public square that could be offensive because it might drive people away from the faith? I mean, there will be, there are aspects yeah, yeah. of. The gospel that are offensive, right? absolutely, or that are exclusivist, yeah. or that make claims on us that demand sacrifice rather than just oh, this fits into no, absolutely. My, my cultural framework. It's, so. But you have there's some wisdom in choosing what hills to fight for and die on. Somebody on mm. Facebook got angry at me. I think on our last podcast because I said that the bathroom stuff was not mm. the hill right. to die on, and right. then you want to know well, what are the hills to die on? And if not the bathroom, Calvary. And that's actually what I wanted to write back. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I think it reminds me of the guy who he got all up in my face one time about well, he wanted to know exactly when I was converted, like when was I saved? And, mm. and yeah. I said, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure it was a Friday about two thousand years ago. <laughs> oh, <laughs> bang! Drop the mic, right? So. Um, <laughs> It was a very good Friday. Uh Oh, that's awesome. Okay. Hey, (laughs) this this month's issue of CT, the cover story is Charleston one year later after the Charleston shootings. Um, What, how are they one year later? Have they changed? Is um, the church the church is still there? Yeah, the church is still there, and so we we sent a reporter and a photographer to spend four or five days with several family members of the victims. And I think you know one of the main themes that came through in the reporting is that a year after the shootings, it's easy for most Americans to think like all is well, like there has been mm-hmm. forgiveness and healing, and yet... The flag is down, and he's on, mm-hmm. he's on, he's going to, it's a capital sentence, yeah. isn't it? Or, uh, yeah, yeah, and, you know, a lot of the family members spoke directly to Dylan Roof shortly after the shooting and extended, mm-hmm. you know, kind of public declarations of forgiveness, which was an, an amazing, amazing moment. And at the same time, forgiveness is both this decision and such a process. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the family members would say, I'm struggling to forgive this man who took my mother or took my wife. Yeah. And the the church itself, I think they have been so bombarded with media and kind of visitors coming to see the church that mm-hmm. they're trying to figure out mm. like who are we right. a year after this. Right. Does and this define us? Are we does, forever yeah, the church I mean, that had an incident? Right. Even, you know, the title on the, our cover, Charleston one year later, the word Charleston is now synonymous with these shootings. Mm-hmm. Mm. And yet people there would say, We are so much more than the worst thing that has happened mm-hmm. to us and we want to be known for more than that. So at the very least, the story is complicated. I think there are lots of uh, notes of hope in it, but the the role of journalists is to make sim- simplistic things complicated. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> so what's the good that that your folks saw when mm. they were down there? What's the good they brought out of it? Yeah, I think a lot of the the family members have um, drawn together. I mean, there is a sort of bonding when you all go through something horrific. Yeah. You you understand each other's pain in a really unique way, and then. The woman who has been the pastor there since January is she knew all of the family members. She knew the church before coming in. And so she's been able to start to mend some mm-hmm. of the divisions that mm-hmm. had that had occurred in the church under an interim pastor. So, you know, it's it's definitely not a, a story of despair. Um, there are there are notes of hope, but there mm-hmm. there I think we wanted to signal to our readers it's this is such a long process Mm -hmm. and, Mm -hmm. and the actual depth of forgiveness won't probably be realized in these people's lifetimes. This is probably something they're going to struggle with till the very end. Does the story touch on the broader implications of Charleston for Mm. the, the the American church and the racial divisions that still plague us? Yeah. Um, Well, one thing we talk about is how significant the shooting was to having the Confederate flag removed from mm-hmm. 
um, the Ca South Carolina Capitol building. And so kind of grappling with an aspect of our nation's history and um, distancing ourselves from the, that history instead of putting it up on top of a building. Right. Mm, pardon me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then also, I mean, we it won't surprise any of our listeners that the majority of our readers are white. And yet we wanted to say with this cover story, we see the members of Emmanuel as as our people, you know, as mm -hmm. we are we are part of the same body and we want to honor their strength and resilience and the strength of and the resilience of the African-American church through the past 300 years, even amidst slavery. Right. Right. Do you think it, it has changed their openness or sense of safety in their community mm. of, you know, having their doors open, of having, yeah. being able to have a stranger just walk into a Bible study? Can you right. preserve that after something like that? I don't know that you can. I mean, we don't direct, direct address that in the story okay. but um it, i mean there's no doubt that the the shooting itself was racially motivated right. for this individual um and so and i think it was easy for a lot of african-american christians to see this as an attack on them like this church is sacred ground and this person came in on sacred ground and mm -hmm. um denied the image of god in us and and hurt us profoundly um I don't know what they're. I don't know what they'll okay. do with the Bible studies. Right. You know. Right. I had a. Uh, we were speaking in Iowa at, at my great grandpa's Bible conference uh, right after that happened, and talked to one man, you know, from a small rural Iowan white church who mm -hmm. was saying because of that they were having elders meetings about whether someone should have a gun mm -hmm. on the premises mm -hmm. at all times because mm -hmm. you know apparently people are, are shooting up churches. Yeah. Well, there have been other incidences, like a New right. Life in Colorado, where there was that yeah. shooting a number of years ago. That's so, true. I mean, it's a public gathering place, and we've had theater shootings and they, they, churches at times. They're high profile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They tend to be high profile churches. What, mm -hmm. what made Charleston a little different was this was clearly racially motivated. Right. It wasn't mm -hmm. merely right. that this is a church. It's, right. It was an African-American church. Mm -hmm. right. So. Okay. Uh, you had a couple other stories. Uh, anyone that you really, really like? The uh, modern Christian pop music story. <laughs> it's funny. It's I don't know that it will surprise anybody, but uh, this according is the, the Nate Silver story. Yeah. 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 According to to a study, modern Christian music is overwhelmingly positive. Like positive, encouraging, <laughs> and safe for the yes. whole family. We might and, say, and overwhelmingly safe for the whole family. Uh, much more likely to talk about life, to mention life than death. Much more likely to mention light than dark. Much more likely to mention grace than sin. Uh, much more likely to mention love than fear, joy than sorrow, mercy than judgment, strong than uh, weak. Um, so, what's it matter? It's kind of a dumb study, in my opinion, only because, like, of course... It's so we're obvious. Well, if yeah. we're worshiping God, of course we're going to dwell on the good news of the gospel rather than our own sinfulness or weakness or darkness. What would have been more interesting is if you compared the content of contemporary Christian music with, say, hymns that were written 100 or 200 years right. ago. Right, right. He did. He did? Yeah, he did. And uh, the traditional hymns were significantly more negative than the current contemporary oh, music. Like Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God yeah. put to music. Put, put to music. That was, yeah. yeah well, uh, except on the issue of weak versus strong. That strong is, hmm. is mentioned equally predominantly 100 years ago as today. Hmm. Okay. The biggest gap was in death versus life. We, we sung about death a whole lot a hundred years ago. We just don't do it anymore. Well, we are a culture that denies death. Yeah. What? What did you say? I didn't hear you say what? We are a culture that denies death. I'm sorry. I didn't hear that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I think one interesting takeaway of the study is just what we expect worship music to do. Mm -hmm. And we've seen contemporary Christian music, that whole scene become much more focused on worship. Right. So it makes yeah. sense that... Yeah. When we turn on the local Christian radio station, we're going to hear more songs about, we're not going to hear Positivity. about like the individual's experience grappling with doubt, or we're not going to do that without like assuring listeners, but you have overcome. Okay. 
<laughs> I'm not grappling anymore. That so, was, that was yesterday, ago. and now is today. The, the hard part for me is if if we if we take the Psalms as sort of the the song and prayer book of Scripture and of ancient Israel, and mm-hmm. the one that Jesus Himself employed and used in His life, you see the whole spectrum of right, the human right. divine relationship from from joy and celebration to lament and struggle and pain mm-hmm. and and where are you God and mm-hmm. how long oh lord and it, but mm-hmm. in our contemporary worship music it tends to be very narrowly focused on just one aspect of the human divine relationship yeah. and is that ultimately m- malformative mm-hmm. i think it is i mean i and i'm not i'm not saying that every worship song should be about wrestling with doubt you know right, i think there yeah. needs to be a balance as but, there is in the psalms let me finish my statement okay um <laughs> but i do think the positivity of our worship music suggests that we do see worship as an ex- we want it to be an uplifting experience mm-hmm. we come to the worship service to be lifted out of whatever we're experiencing and that has been the role of worship if you think about like african-american spirituals mm-hmm. that provided a lot of like hope and resilience in the midst of really hard things. They mm-hmm. probably didn't want to gather to talk about how hard like life under mm-hmm. enslavement was. Well, so I, I think worship can provide hope, but I do wonder if we're only singing about hope and positive feelings. We're not actually um, like bringing our full selves before God. Here's an interesting quote from this story. One group of Christians who are particularly poorly served by uniformly upbeat themes in worship is, quote, winter Christians, a group described as having a relationship with God that is more touched by pain, distance, or doubt. They can't recognize themselves in the Walt Disneyfication of contemporary Christian music. Right. That's my question is, I I agree with you, Caitlin. It does, we've always used Christian worship from, 2,000 years ago to give us a higher perspective and put our mm-hmm. suffering in its broader context of God's victory. But when you make no mention of the darker realities of life and the tragedies and the struggles, don't we, in a sense, invalidate people who are in those places and saying, hey, if you're not ready to clap your hands and jump for joy, then there must be something deficient and wrong with you. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Right. the church should be a place, and traditionally the church calendar took you through different right, seasons right. that, that right. validated those experiences, like mm-hmm. Lent. Even Advent used to be a time of more mm-hmm. solemn reflection mm-hmm. rather right. than just singing Christmas carols. Yeah, the difference there is that in the Christian tradition, like the framing of Lent or, or Easter or, you know, the, the framing of the church calendar was not... How do we validate people's feelings? Uh, right, <laughs> but, 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 what it, but what it did do about is it carried it carried a community though through those different elements of yes. the divine human relationship. Yes, from repentance to right. lament to celebration you can only to do joy. That. You can only you can only drag people through the negative parts if they don't really have easy options of other places to go that are all positive. You know, so you kind of have to go back to. The same thing with church curriculum. When your denomination gave you all the curriculum for your church, they could make right. you look at unpleasant topics. But when every church is buying on uh, the free market, whatever is easiest to put on and whatever seems like it'll be the most fun, mm-hmm. you have to compete to be more appealing. Same thing with worship mm-hmm. music. So it's the free market of Christian yes, music it's and the free market. content. It's, it's right. the denominational free market you know, that started mm-hmm. in America because it's, it's, we're not going to set up a state church. Right, it's First Amendment's means fault. we're not going <laughs> to give you, you know, one prayer book that mm-hmm. everyone in America has to go through that will take you through even the parts you don't want to go through. We only want to go through the parts we want to go through through. And nobody's going to stop us because we're mm-hmm. Americans. I absolutely agree. Mm-hmm. You should write a book about that. I, yeah, I maybe I will one day. I written several, yes. actually. <clears throat> it's on silent <laughs> because I was getting text messages about my upcoming dentist appointment. Sorry, Sky has to go to the dentist. Would you like to sing along if only it's a happy song or will you get mad if the song turns a little sad? Will you take your kids to the zoo or is that not something you're gonna do because it might smell morally funky to have all those enslaved monkeys, but Caitlin says that's really bad. (laughs) Sky's not so sure. He's kind of (laughs) glad. 
uh, but cows seem to be perfectly fine. <laughs> they sit around in their pens until it's time <laughs> to be eaten by the people who brought them into this world due to our popular uh, breeding methods and our care for God's creation. I don't know what that was about. You can write your own song at home and send it in. Thank you very much. Remember to go to the Patreon page and sign up and support us. And have a great week, and we'll see you next time. The Phil Fisher Podcast is produced by Phil Fisher Enterprises and recorded live at Jellyfish Lab Studios. This episode was edited by Jason Rugg and was fact-checked by absolutely no one. For more information, go to philfisher.com. Oh,